Well, blessed Sunday to you as we come to you with your weekly worship. It is the 11th Sunday after Pentecost. And just a reminder that if you choose to join us in person, we do have the option of staying in your car, listening to the service as you drive in the vicinity of our churches, 830 at Central, 1030 at East. And this week, we're going to be hearing one of Jesus's healing stories. But really, it's more of a story about how Jesus taught about the Sabbath, about the day of rest. What is the purpose of the day of rest? Is it to rest from doing good, or is it to free us to do good? More on that as we get to the verse today. But let us begin with the good news that Christ has set us free. He set us free on the cross. And so therefore, if we but trust in him, we too can have eternal life. We too can have forgiveness of sins. It is where we place our faith today. But we need to confess our sins, to tell Jesus that we have done wrong. Of course, to tell our hearts that so that we turn from our wicked ways, our wicked idols, things that we do to replace God. Let us begin in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Just and gracious God, we come to you for healing in life. Our sin hurts others and diminishes us. We confess them to you. Our lives bear the scars of sin. We bring these also to you. Show us your mercy, O God. Bind up our wounds. Forgive us our sins and free us for the love of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore t t uh, forgive all your sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, mighty and immortal, you know that as fragile creatures surrounded by great dangers, we cannot by ourselves stand upright. Give us strength of mind and body, so that even when we suffer because of human sin, we may rise victorious through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading comes from Isaiah chapter 58, beginning with the second part of verse 9. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom will be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places. Make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall rise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to live in. If you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and a holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it not by going your own ways, serving your own interests, or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Our second reading comes from Hebrews chapter 12, beginning with verse 18. The writer writes, You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice of whose words made the hearers beg not another word be spoken to them. 
for they could not endure the order that was given, even if an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the innumerable angels in festal gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better than the words of the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now, as he promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks, by which we offer God a more acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for indeed our God is a consuming fire. Here ends our second lesson. Our gospel today comes from Luke 13, beginning with verse 12, uh, 10. Now he, Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he had laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which to work and work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie an ox or a donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had bound for eighteen long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he had said this, all the opponents were put to shame. And the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. My friends, this is the good news, the gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious to God, open our eyes, open our ears to what you have to teach us on the Sabbath. Let us use the Sabbath not just merely for rest, but for freeing us to shine our light. Let us not hold on to traditions that we think are important to the Sabbath rather than what you desire of the Sabbath, to set people free. And so on this day, whether it be a Sabbath day or not, convict us to use this day of rest, this day to not be doing our usual work, to be doing what you desire of us to do. Lord, give us your insight and give us your hope. Bless the words of my mouth and those who hear them in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll say this at the end, but I'll say this at the beginning. Two of the questions that really are not answered in this passage are simply these. Jesus does not give specific insight into what needed to be done or needs to be done on the Sabbath, or what constitute rest, and what doesn't constitute rest. The other thing, Jesus once again heals someone, we don't know why, and it is the same mystery of why some are healed and some are not immediately. But we have to leave those two mysteries 
as we enter into the greater question and issue of this passage or these passages that are before us today. And that issue is, what is Sabbath? What is rest? We do not want to come to this passage, especially the gospel, and think that you have one maintaining the Sabbath and the other not maintaining. Jesus is coming not to end the law or end the Sabbath. He is coming to refocus it. For as it says in our Isaiah passage, does it not? You from refrain from trampling on the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on this holy day. So what were the interests of the Sabbath? What are the interests of the Sabbath? Well, number one is what the people are doing. Verse 10, it says, does it not? Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. It's very interesting in Martin Luther's explanation of the Ten Commandments, if you've remembered it from maybe the time you studied or memorized it, it will say simply, we are to fear and love God so that we do not despise God's word or the hearing of it, but regard it as holy and gladly hear and learn it. One interesting thing is missing from his explanation. On what day are we supposed to be doing this? Luther leaves that a mystery. Or dare I say, Luther leaves that open. There are some Christian traditions that say you have to continue the Jewish practice of worshiping or resting on the seventh day, Saturday. In the Christian parlance, it has turned into the day of resurrection, the new day, the interrupted day. One have called it sometimes the eighth day. I've made this analogy many times to the circle that is our baptismal font. It's eight-sided. God's baptism creates a new day in the week. And I would say the way to remember it is the old Beatles song, how many times are we to love someone eight days a week? It is something new and different that is entering into the process. But the question still remains, how do we honor the Sabbath? In one of my previous calls, I have what was called a mutual ministry committee. And I was naive in who I picked, but I was also naive in the troubles that could happen in those discussions. A lot of times they would revolve around what the pastor is doing right and what the pastor is doing wrong. And one of the discussions was simply about the day I took off. Some thought that there had to have been a rule, that it had to be on Monday. Others thought that I was inappropriate in taking off on Friday. And then a parishioner, who really spoke more than I think she was even intending on saying, thought that a pastor should never have a day off if they were imitating God. And then I've had those moments where I've put my foot in my mouth, but this person said, is there in there, there isn't a commandment about this. And one of the other parishioners says, yes, it's number three. The Sabbath keeping in our culture is sometimes one of those great commandments that is most ignored. Sure, it doesn't get headlines like breaking the sixth or the fifth on stealing or adultery or even coveting and all the other things, maybe even worshiping the wrong God. But it is amazing how piously we can sound when we break the third commandment, thinking that we are just too busy to rest. Too busy to rest. Now, according to the two versions of the Ten Commandments, and I'm going to talk about that. There are two versions of the Ten Commandments. The first one is in Exodus 20. And in Exodus 20, it simply gives an explanation of why we are to have a Sabbath day. Because on the Sabbath day, the Lord rested. And so, therefore, if we as men and women are created in the image of God, as it says in Genesis 1.27, we too should rest. But there is also another explanation 
and that is found in Deuteronomy's Ten Commandments. Remember the word Deuteronomy means second law. It's just Moses reiterating the Ten Commandments. And this time the explanation is not about imitating our Lord on the seventh day. It is about being slaves before and the Sabbath is for setting people free. You were once slaves in Egypt. In other words, you worked seven days. You had no days of rest. You were enslaved to the power of Pharaoh. But now to show that you are created in the image of God, you not only should rest on the Sabbath day, but you should free others to rest because it specifically says, if you have the foreigner or others who do not practice your law, you compel them to rest also on this day. And so what we have here in this passage in Luke 13 is a debate about what is the Sabbath day and how do we keep it holy. And so you have a woman here. There appeared a woman who had the spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. It's viewed as a possession. Jesus had compelled many demons to come out. Of course, he was accused of having the wrong type of uh, spirit, the wrong type of power that came from Beelzebul. But she was bent over with this. It manifested in physical characteristics. And she was quite unable to stand straight up. In the original Greek, it says she was not able to live to the fullest or stand up to the fullest. She was bent over and quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called over to her and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. Now, in most cases, Jesus being the word, that would be enough. But she is not healed until Jesus, breaking another Sabbath, keeping yourself from unclean things, a person or one who has been possessed, someone who has an ailment would be considered unclean. Jesus is not afraid to not only speak her word of healing, but touch her either making himself unclean or making her clean. And that's the question. Is the spirit in him more powerful than hers or is hers more powerful than his? He doesn't just simply say the word. One could even say in our culture where it's so easy to text or so easy to say thoughts and prayers. But the question is, are we going to go out and do the things that we believe and Jesus doesn't just say, you are healed. He goes over to her, touches her, and immediately she stands up straight, praising God. See, he interpreted the Sabbath as a time to set people free. Why? Because they are listening to the word of God, if not receiving the word of God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath. Now listen to this. There's no commandment that says that you cannot cure on the Sabbath. Rabbis over centuries had finally realized that there are certain works that you do or cannot do on the Sabbath. If you ever talk to uh, one of our Jewish friends, especially if they come from a more conservative branch of Judaism, there are amazing things that you are not allowed to do on the Sabbath. Everything from simply even turning on a light, or when my confirmation students went to a synagogue, they were not allowed to write a sermon note because writing was considered something that you just don't do on the Sabbath. And that has always been the question. Is it simply to make sure that you're following all of these rules of rest? Or is it to set people free so that you show that you are not enslaved to a higher power, enslaved to a pharaoh, or dare even an unclean spirit that has bent you over for 18 years? But the Pharisee, or the leader of the synagogue, continues, There are six days on which to work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath. 
We will have, and always have had, many excuses for what we can do, but dare I say sometimes we have excuses of what we can't do. I can't help that person. It's my day of rest. How many times I would often say that, even as a pastor. But then I realize this is not about the things I can't do. It is freeing me for the things I can do. Some people would say that we stay out of trouble because things just get too complicated. I like my quiet world. In fact, Luther said some people will not do some good things lest they get entangled in sin. And that's where Luther has his famous quote that sometimes gets taken out of context. If, you're, if you are compelled to sin, then sin boldly on those days. But when we find an excuse to not do the right thing, that's where we probably are, in the words of Isaiah 58, trampling on the Sabbath. And the other thing that Jesus doesn't trample on is not the initial purpose of the Sabbath. He tramples on laws that prevent us from doing good on the Sabbath. For it says in our Hebrews passage that when God comes, all of the old things are going to pass away, not just the things on earth, the things in heaven. It is going to be a new restoration and that's why the Lord, once again, uses the word that we heard last week. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites. We're not sure in the Greek if it is simply hypocrites or hypocrite pointing to the religious leader. It could be pointing to all of us. Do not each of you on the Sabbath untie an ox or a donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water. See, this is an argument that was very common in Judaism. If not so, what about this? And it goes from the lesser to the greater. And that's where Hebrews was actually saying, the Lord once shook the earth, then he's going to shake the earth and the heaven. You care so much for an animal that you own. But here is a woman created in the image of God, and you are telling yourself because of your law you're not going to help her on this day in order to keep the rules of the Sabbath. This is not right. And so ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had bound for 18 years, be set free from bondage on the Sabbath day? And that's because Jesus is not just stuck in Exodus' explanation of the third commandment, a day of rest. It is a day to set people free, Deuteronomy 6. It's a time to move on to the real purpose of the Sabbath. Now, it is interesting, she is called a daughter of Abraham, and sometimes that was a euphemism for someone who didn't grow up Jewish. It is a euphemism for someone who was a, uh, a convert, someone who discovered Judaism and wanted to be part of it. I was told by a very knowledgeable person that if you convert to Judaism, you get a Hebrew name of your choice, but forever you will be called a son and daughter of Abraham. That will be your second name. And so it is with this woman who Jesus didn't just speak the word. He brought her into the fellowship. She now is a daughter of Abraham, and she was received on the Sabbath day. When he had said this, his all his opponents were put to shame. The entire crowd, not just disciples and those against him, but the crowd where Jesus seems to be getting either supporters or critics, were rejoicing at the wonderful things that he was doing. Do people rejoice at the wonderful things the church does as we choose to follow and take up our cross and follow Jesus? Are we going to be people that shine our light as we read about in Isaiah 58? Are we going to be the people left over after the great shaking and fire of the word of God found in Hebrews today? Or are we going to be people that are going to be as shallow as the words we speak and not our actions that we do? That is the real question with this passage and that's where we come back to the very initial thing. 
It doesn't answer why some are healed and others are not. And it doesn't give us very specific things to tell us what we can and what we can't do if we are to be, quote-unquote, rule-abiding people on the Sabbath. But it does give us the vision and the option to see past these man-made synagogue rules and to worship a God who not only set us free on Good Friday, but sets others free. So that when we worship and come together and listen to God's word, we do it more than just hearing the word, but we do it also. My friends, we need to rest more than we usually do. We are busying ourselves like Martha on things that do not matter. But we also need to make sure that we are doing the things that God has called us to. Let us pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks today for the good news that you have freed us so that we can live our lives, our whole lives, every day of the week as if it were a Sabbath day. Let us make sure that we focus on you in our life and in our actions. All these things we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our psalm today is Psalm 103. It is a praise the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the grave and crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with your desires and good things, so that your youth is renewed like an eagle's. O Lord, you provide for the vindication and justice of all who are oppressed. You made known your ways to Moses and your works to the children of Israel. Lord, you are full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And so now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you today. We pray that this is a time where you can listen to God's word. And do not forget to join us in person if you are able. God bless you. Take care. Have a wonderful weekend.